Is it Joe's? <clears throat> I keep refreshing. Well, that indicates that it is now streaming here on the uh, desktop. Yeah. Oh, there it is. I got it. Yeah, it's coming up for me too. Right? I've got a killer that we'll have. <laughs> and I can keep an eye on it, Terry, for um, visitors and questions. All right. Thank you, Jay. I got it. Okay. So we have right now 25 participants that have uh, logged into the Zoom meeting, and there are a lot of new names that I don't recognize. Uh, so uh, if this is your first time to join one of our Zoom meetings, I'm going to ask you to speak up and uh, introduce yourself. My name is Brad Moore. I'm a new member. This is my first time at a meeting. Hi, Brad. So are you Austin or just uh, new to this club? Uh, I'm new to the club and the area. I'm uh, trying to get started with the beginning astrophotography group, but I wasn't able to go in May and June was canceled. Uh, so I'm still working on getting into astrophotography. Okay, let me uh, let me just talk for real briefly since you brought it up about our adventures in getting an astrophotography class. Uh, we started, uh, we contacted somebody in, in uh, January and thought it'd be a good idea to get them to uh, help us put on a, a really one astrophotography class. And uh, it took a while to get things set up, uh, but uh, we were basically going to she was, do a program that had uh, oh, uh, a Zoom meeting for getting your stuff together and a Zoom meeting, uh, not a Zoom meeting, but an actual uh, in the field uh, uh, shooting, uh, collecting data, taking uh, images. Um, and they were going to do that at Bad Wolf Ranch, our dark sky site. Then there was a follow-up meeting for processing all the images. And so at the end of that, everybody would have their first beginning uh, astro uh, photograph. Uh, and uh, weather and other circumstances have really been playing havoc with us this spring. They did have one imaging session at uh, Bad Wolf, but they changed the day. They moved it up a day because the weather was going to go south on them. It was the only time they could do it. So only about half of the class was able to show up, and uh, they've been trying to set up follow-up classes since then. So they did one in June earlier this month when it was still raining, so they had to cancel that. So they're going to try in July and, and there'll be another one in August. Uh, and uh, I, if you've signed up for this initial class, you should be able to attend any of either of those and hopefully still get everything you paid for there. Mm -hmm. I got mixed reviews from the people that attended the imaging session uh, at Bad Wolf uh, that uh, some things worked and some things didn't. Uh, uh, actually, if you felt like uh, it didn't work for you, you might uh, try, uh, try to show up again for one of the f uh, following imaging sessions. Uh, the, uh, we talked about this at the EC and decided that maybe this wasn't the right route to pursue uh, bringing in a third party this way, because the club actually has some very excellent photographers in it. <clears throat> Thinking now about uh, probably trying to set up, uh, if we want to do 101 type astrophotography training, uh, let's ask some of our own very excellent people to set up and run that and uh, take our time setting it up. Uh, so we're going to kind of pursue that avenue going forward and uh, see how well that works. Okay. Well, like I said, I was unable to make the May meeting because of the timing change. And, but uh, the people have been very helpful to me in terms of talking to me about equipment and getting things set up and giving hints and things like that. So uh, hopefully this will come off. Okay. Uh, we hope it works uh, eventually there and uh, hang in with us. We'll try to make it work one way or the other. Okay. Anybody else new to uh, introduce them? Terry, yes. Terry, just out of curiosity, do we, do we have an astro imaging special interest group in the club? Not really. No. We should maybe think about trying to form one just for the, the training purposes. Hell yeah. So uh, do we have anybody who would like to champion that and take on the development of such a SIG? <laughs> I'll, 
Okay, that's uh, that's. I'm not sure what all that would entail, but I mean, I'd be happy to discuss it, and we can move forward if it's just a. Uh, I, I don't know what it would look like, but I'm happy to try to help if I can. Well, I, I can tell you this is that you know from previous experience with the with the club in Oregon, the the SIGs generally set you know their own me meeting schedules and and uh, met whenever whenever they. Uh, found it most convenient to. So they didn't necessarily have to conform to any kind of meeting schedule that the rest of the club had. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the same thing with, with meeting place too. Now, of course, you know, right now we're, we're meeting every, everybody's meeting on zoom. So that isn't really that big of a challenge. And I'm presuming that uh, as far as discussing astrophotography and, uh, going over equipment and, and whatnot. Uh, I don't know how much that would have to be hands-on and how much could actually be done uh, over a Zoom meeting. That might be worth looking into. I mean, I think you, you could at least go over the basics in a Zoom meeting, uh, even without the hands-on experience. Yeah, and that applies to several aspects of it. I mean, it could be mm -hmm. using equipment. It could be... <clears throat> Imaging, how, how to capture, uh, it could be how to process. Uh, all the various tools that they use could be demoed over uh, Zoom for the most part, so. I think the, the hands-on, the, you know, one-on-one, one, one-on-five, you know, two on whatever numbers work out is, would be far better than any type of meetings or documents or, because I, really th there's so many forums and YouTube videos that can, that present that information very well. I think the hands-on, you know, this is your equipment. Let's set it up. Let's I agree with you, Bob, that you're yeah. absolutely right. Uh, I'm just saying that once you've kind of established that group, there are some things that you could probably take care of uh, over short Zoom sessions. Yep, yep, absolutely. Say well, focus on Zoom sessions. Uh, Felix, uh, do you uh, have the experience on astrophotography? Did you lead a a group? Felix? Oh, myself, me? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm trying to learn. I've got the equipment, okay. but I'm trying to use sequence generator, which the, uh, the class that was being offered didn't deal with sequence generator, and that's the one I'm trying to learn. Okay, well, here's the deal. We want to start also astrophotography sessions that are very basic. Uh, there's a lot of folks interested, but they don't want to go into the advanced part or advanced equipment. They want to start first with the basic. And we really would like to have somebody to spearhead the basics parts. Now, from my perspective, member services, what I want to provide is a comfortable and adequate training facility for us. When we go to Batwood Ranch, we need to have that facility. And I'm working on this very specific issue, a training area that would be comfortable, that would be adequate and equipped. And if somebody would spearhead these training sessions, I would coordinate with that person and, and I would make sure that the whatever is necessary that we need to have there for a particular training field session, that we will make it so. So if anybody is interested in spearheading a, a, a basics or a, a, a startup astrophotography courses um, get with me and we'll work together to have that facility available and ready for any day any time that we need to do that okay all right okay uh, before we get too diverged here uh, so we can handle the astrophotography uh, in the manner of a special interest group, as, as Greg alluded to, or it could be a program for member services or some kind of mix. I think uh, if we want to rely on our, our own resources, and the first thing to do is to identify experts that are willing to contribute to that. I know uh, there is a 150 member Facebook group called Austin Astrophotographers, and about a third of those guys are current members or have been members of AAS. Uh, and Bob, I, I know you're probably a member of that group too. So uh, Bob has already 
just uh, sort of volunteer to help here. And I think we can find a couple of other people that might be willing to contribute, then we can, uh, we can move forward with this. And the exact outline of how we move forward, uh, we'll just leave that open for the time being. But I, I do hear your point, Domingo, having a facility to do this would, would facilitate things quite a bit. Okay, I want to allow other new members to introduce themselves. If anybody feels so inclined. Um, I'm Michael Sachs. I'm a new member and I'm very interested in, um, uh, I've been interested in amateur photography for quite some time, but I'm really interested in, in uh, star parties and, and eventually getting my own telescope and trying to get serious about this. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, I'll uh, let you know that uh, one of the programs we do offer is a loaner scope for beginning uh, uh, level telescopes. Uh, actually, uh, uh, it's run under the uh, uh, equipment chair, Greg, but uh, Domingo and I and several other people also participate in uh, tracking the scopes and getting those into to new users' hands. Uh, so we have uh, on the website, uh, theoretically, we have a sign out page or at least a reservation page for uh, uh, reserving one of the loaner scopes. I don't know what state it's in. I keep hearing uh, discussion that we're going to get it uh, fully up and running with a complete picture catalog of all the scopes that are available. Uh, so I don't know, Domingo or Greg, if you guys want to speak to that for a second. Well, one thing I, I'm interested in doing, I've been doing research on this for a while, um, and uh, I've kind of sent, I've kind of, I mean, what I'm looking to do is maybe get something like an eight inch reflector Celestron um, in that area uh, with, it, with the equatorial mount and, and a number of other goodies. And then what I want to do is uh, get the, um, link it to my digital camera and, uh, and be able to start doing um, those kinds of things. So it's a big investment, and, uh, but it's something I've been wanting to do probably since I was a kid. And I've had some telescopes before, but I've never had a, um, besides that old beauty I see above me on Brian Lippincott's, I don't know what that is. It's, 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 it, whatever it is, it looks extremely cool. I assume that's not the loner telescope you're referring to. No, um, no, it's okay. not. <laughs> All right, so. Um, but I, I think the loan is fine, but it's, it's more of a question of just really begin to understand, you know, what's involved because the technology has changed tremendously and what you can do these days is, uh, pretty amazing, but you have like everything else, you have to know what you're doing. And, uh, it's more of just sort of getting tips and tricks and maybe starting simple and, uh, learning how to do that. Well, Michael, uh, yes. if, if you get with me. And you and I can chat to see what is this, what are your needs and what are your desires of these needs. Uh, I can I can match up a, a scope for you because I do have right now an eight inch uh, Smith Cassegrain that that uh, it has tracking. It doesn't have go to capabilities, but that's that's a good thing, not necessarily a bad thing. The go to capabilities kind of take the fun out of astronomy and learning about telescopes. So it is a very classic uh, meat telescope, mm -hmm. but it has tracking mm -hmm. and no, it's a very good one. Is it an eight inch Smith Cassegrain? So it's got a lot of power. Yeah. It's a little bit heavy, but I mean, weight wise, it's gonna weigh about 60, 60 pounds, 40 to 60 pounds, I forgot how much it was, but it's a very good one. I can get it to you, but first I would like to discuss with you, what are your needs? What is it, your expectations? Um, on this scope, and then if that's a good one, I can get that one to you quick. Yeah, no, I appreciate that very much. I, I'm not so sure I want to borrow anybody's scope. I, I having my own expensive camera equipment that I've invested over many years. You know, I'm ultra paranoid about it. And well, these are a this yeah. society scope. These, these, oh. these are not my scope. This is not somebody. These belong to the uh, to the society, okay. and they're meant okay. for members to borrow with no cost, no attachments, yeah, and, and use it as if it's yours. You get it alone for six months and you can renew the loan for another six months after that if you need to. Uh, so it's not like you're gonna be borrowing my scope 
or somebody else. Okay, okay. It is that's... a society soap and it's meant exactly for that for members to use. Yeah, that's yeah. wonderful because what if I could even get a if I could get like a uh, a camera because one of the things I'm trying to learn how to do is <clears throat> exactly how you obtain the best images. Um, you, for example, you don't do long, long exposure, you do multiple imaging and then do uh, stacking and all that. There's a lot of software that's involved in learning how to do that, right? Yeah, and well, I've, all that equipment you know, has nothing to do with the scope itself. But no, I understand. Scope, but okay, guys, uh, anyway, I didn't we'll really talk mean about to start uh, uh, a session quite like this. It's kind of uh, 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 a little bit, so. We're just geeking out, that's all. But let me, yeah, I, was just about, I was just about to, uh, <laughs> Say, uh, let's turn it over to the next person, please. Yeah, I think uh, there we have resources that you can get in touch with, and uh, let's just communicate and uh, point you in those directions. Like I said, we're trying to set up something ourselves uh, around mm -hmm. astrophotography or, or imaging. Okay, uh, so uh, unless somebody else real quick wants to introduce themselves, I'm going to move on. Uh, we'll go down our officer's report, and the first... Uh, uh, roll up there is a report we usually get from our vice president. Uh, we just finished a term uh, and are starting a new year in terms of the uh, executive committee. Uh, and we don't have a vice president for this term at this point. Uh, the vice president's role is basically the person who is responsible for our arranging our speakers at these monthly meetings and also our, our meeting venues, uh, which uh, have pretty much been limited to Zoom for the past year. Uh, we used to meet uh, regularly on the UT campus and we kind of hope to meet there again uh, in the future, maybe this fall. Uh, we have dreams about having our own venue, uh, but uh, uh, we'll, <laughs> uh, sometimes that seems like a pipe dream, but it's always something if we get it uh, just enough, we may, uh, may develop that. Uh, so I'll just stand in for the non-existent VP right now and say that we've got speakers lined up for July and uh, August. Uh, in July, uh, we have a very bright uh, young man who's about to uh, uh, begin attending the University of Illinois, I think. Uh, he is, uh, he was a, uh, he's a Korean national who went to school at St. Stephen's here in Austin. In his senior year, he decided it'd be a good idea to build a radio telescope. Uh, so uh, he did that and uh, used it to make observations in the 21 centimeter band, which is uh, a lot of stuff up there. So we're gonna bring him in and, and have him tell us uh, how to do uh, radio, uh, radio telescope astronomy on the cheap. And uh, he'll recount uh, you know, his experiences there. He'll also give us kind of an introduction to radio astronomy. Pardon me, Terry. Yes. Dawn says she can be ready in under 15. Okay, no problem. All right. Uh, on, uh, in August, uh, Dr. Ed Wiley uh, will join us. Uh, he is a member of the, I'll never get the initials right, AAVSO, the American Association for Variable Star Observers. Uh, this is the oldest, I think, uh, fraternal order of astronomers anyway, special interest group in astronomy. Uh, they date from the 19th century. Uh, and uh, there's actually, you know, so much of astronomy is devoted to, to, to variable stars. Uh, it's always been a frustrating thing for me because I never have had the patient to watch a star vary. <laughs> Even uh, Algol, which I think blinks on and off every two or three days, I've never been able to really watch that, that light curve change. But anyway, uh, Ed can tell us why it's important to understand variable stars and uh, what their programs are all about. So we look forward to hearing from him in August. Uh, after that, we're open. Uh, we had a little discussion earlier uh, about several potential uh, uh, speakers. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll talk some more about those uh, in our executive committee meetings and uh, by word of mouth. If anybody knows anybody who is a speaker on astronomical topics, or if, it, or if you would like to talk about something you're particularly interested in, uh, let one of the officers know, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll either pursue that or, or help you set up if you want to do presentation. We do like to have at least one or two presentations a year made from our own membership. So if you have a, a special 
a topic that's dear to your heart, just let us know and, and uh, we'll put you on the schedule. All right, uh, uh, treasure report, did uh, Patrick make it in? Is Patrick with us? Okay, doesn't appear to be, okay. Uh, we do have a, a, a not insignificant bank account. Uh, we get a lot of our money uh, from our membership dues, probably about uh, a third of what we kind of, the level we kind of keep in the, uh, the account over the year uh, comes from, from membership dues. Um, uh, we'll be talking about budgets a little bit here uh, in a minute, in a few minutes, a little bit about budgets. So give you some idea of where some of this money comes from and where it goes. Okay, uh, so this brings us to our outreach chair, uh, Joyce. Uh, we had originally said that we were gonna have a public star party at Petanales Falls on June the 26th, but unfortunately I've just found out recently the, the ranger there hadn't realized that uh, some other group has reserved the Star Theater for that day. So we are looking at uh, going into July Hopefully the 17th of July for a public star party. Uh, there's, uh, I got an email today from Stephen and he said it's fine with him, but he was gonna do some checking with other people in the park just to make sure so that, so that we don't have, we don't set a date and then have to change it the way we did on June the 26th. So I will, just as soon as I know anything for sure, I will be letting everybody know. We're also gonna be working on setting up the schedule for the rest of the year since we are now at a point where we can do that apparently. Um, not sure about Inks Lake. I have not really been in contact with them during the whole pandemic as to uh, whether or not they want us to come back. I wanna get our schedule for Petronales Fall set because we, we, we really have an obligation to them first because of the fact that they're letting us have our observatory there. But, um, we will uh, see what we can schedule there and then figure out Inks Lake. And I imagine we're gonna start getting requests from schools and other nonprofit groups uh, for star parties. And I will be sending uh, out information on that as we get it and hope that everybody has this uh, pent up interest in doing outreach and uh, we'll be back to where we used to be. Okay, thank you, Joyce. Uh, it's time to get it ramped up and I look forward to, to uh, uh, really getting back into the swing of doing some useful outreach. Okay, uh, member services, we've already chatted a little bit about, but uh, the primary uh, focus of member services are our private star parties and other programs that we set up to enrich our, our membership. Uh, but a big focus on the private star parties uh, these are currently conducted at uh, our dark sky site north of Lamb Pass. This is called Bad Wolf Ranch. Uh, and uh, we have uh, 20 acres out there. Uh, I actually got an aerial picture of it. Is there a question I heard? This is a Google Earth view of uh, our observing site. And as you can see, it's out in the middle of a lot of prairie and scrub, uh, scrub uh, juniper. Uh, the 20 acres, this is probably the property line here and down here as well. Uh, it has one barn on it. And we also have an observatory that sits right about here with a 12 inch uh, Meade LX200 in it. Uh, we have electricity, we have a portable to uh, a porta potty out there, uh, no potable water at the moment. Uh, we do have uh, 100, uh, 200 amp electric service that we can piggyback off of. Uh, the main observing areas that we've used so far are in front of the barn here and a little bit along this driveway here and maybe some spillover in here. The main parking areas have been uh, roughly in that area. So uh, what I've uh, suggested Domingo do is we get a high resolution picture of this if we can, maybe get a drone out there so we can get kind of a graphic uh, representation of the layout. If we've got any graphic artists that wanna work with us, get a drawing tool on there. Uh, I would like to 
put in, uh, uh, Domingo is going to talk a little bit later about he's ready to put in some observing tables uh, similar to what we had at, at COE uh, in years gone by that we can run electrical service to. I'd like to map out where those observing tables might go, where the parking area is going to be delineated and it, other infrastructure things. We're also talking about a storage shed uh, and uh, at some point in the future, uh, building possibly a roll off roof observatory for uh, larger telescopes. So I'd like to map those out on this, uh, this plot here as, as we go along, as we think, we think about uh, these projects that we wanna do in the future. Uh, this is a Bortle two-ish three type site. Uh, it only has one really significant light dome, it comes from Fort Hood, which is in the Southeast. Uh, once you get to the south and all the way over to the east, it's pretty dark uh, along all the horizons. So a good place for imagers, a great place for visual observing. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we, are, we have the opportunity, if we want to uh, go ahead and, and plan one for uh, a star party out there, the first one we, would have, we will have held in a long time as a club uh, in July. Uh, and I get my moon calendar up here just a minute. I believe we were talking about the 10th. Uh, the 10th. Uh, July 17th. Well, 17th to the 10th. No. Well, Joyce 10th, is on. 10th, 10th for members and 17th for uh, public at uh, Pattern oh, Alice. There Correct. you go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 10th is, is very close to new moon within a day of new moon. Uh, it is the new moon. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, also start on this and back out so uh, you can see what it looks like on Google Maps, where it's located. Mm, always get lost here. <clears throat> All right, I'm just gonna start in this area and go to Maps and we'll zoom out a little bit so you <clears throat> So this is the town of Lampasas, which is about 50 miles north of downtown Austin. So uh, 30 miles from North Austin, 35, I guess. Uh, and uh, it's where 183 and 281 cross. So we go about 10 miles up uh, 281 and hook a right and about three miles off on some unpaved roads. We have the dark sky site there. Uh, you've got Colleen and Fort Hood over here. Uh, temple over here, and here's North Austin. So it's a trip up basically up 183 to get to Land Passes. Uh, so from uh, North Austin, it's uh, all said and done, it's about an hour and 15 minutes to get up there, I believe. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, uh, before, uh, uh, all right, so uh, anybody have any input on having the star party out there uh, on the 10th? Any, or, uh, all right, so I'm not member services, so I don't know if you wanna jump in here, Domingo, but we need to organize, put an announcement out that we're gonna be there, anything we wanna set up, we need to do that, so. Uh, what needs to be done to, to get us started with a, you know, a, a, a new private members only star party? Right. Well, we, we, um, we need to mow the grass. And I talked to Alan the other day, and we're going to be there on the 18th of June. And we're going to clean up the entire uh, tall grass and everything. And by that time, I'm going to be able to take at least six tables to add to the uh, the one or two that are already over there. So we can have at least some tables available. Now these will not have power at the time because uh, we haven't resolved that issue. Um, but we, we, do have have the, tables. we do have the uh, extension cords. With multiple That's apps. correct. We have the extension cords and we can set up the tables as close as we can to the uh, power outlet and those tables will have power from that extension cord. Yes, thank you. You're absolutely right. Yes, we have that. All right, but I do want to have maybe by the 10th, a uh, small training area that we can have. So the people that come in 
early, like one or two in the afternoon, we may be able to set up a, a practical astronomy session there or something. Okay, so the idea is uh, have some people arrive considerably before dark. Uh, we can organize uh, some training, uh, an astronomy 101 type session there if you're Correct. a newbie. Uh, otherwise, figure that you would need uh, an hour or so before uh, twilight to uh, set up out there. Uh, so uh, I... What are we going to what What are we uh, going to say about you know the Are there any COVID restrictions out there? Are we Well, I was going to ask the um, EC committee on, on on the next EC meeting that we have. What is what we consensus going to have as far as uh, the the restrictions and also following the the uh, the, the uh, CDC guidelines uh, as it getting more unrestricted and unrestricted every day, uh, what it is today could be totally different next month. I mean, it could be completely totally open. I mean, the government here in Texas thinks it's already great to have it all open, but what does the people feel like is, is different? And what would make people comfortable is, is um, feel by that day. But a month, a month from now, it might be different. So. I don't want to make that call. I wanted to consult with everybody in the EC. What what would that be? Okay, we will have an EC meeting before that, uh, before the tenth, I believe. So we can Correct. outline some protocol steps there. I think what we're relying on uh, is that uh, the majority of people in attendance are probably going to be in the vaccinated crowd, uh, which uh, uh, should. Uh, uh, provide some measure of comfort, at least for the vaccinated people. Uh, we still may want to set up with uh, sufficient distance between anybody or set up an area that is where people can spread out a little more if they want to do that. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll work on that and communicate that from our next uh, EC meeting uh, okay. in early July. Okay. Uh, so uh, one thing that also, uh, Joyce, this was uh, kind of as member services, but I think Joyce, you've got probably the better connections right now. Got a letter from uh, a member, Ron, Ronan Kerr. Uh, actually, wasn't he a speaker? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think they joined AAS and they want to go out to Pedernales uh, tomorrow. Uh, they're just asking about what the rules are out there. Uh, and I, I did reply to him that I believe, uh, for instance, the, uh, the gates are, are, are open all the time. At least the exit gate is always open. Uh, the uh, rangers uh, leave the visitor center. They close that up at, uh, I think, 6 p.m. Uh, there is uh, a self-service kiosk for... Uh, Mission fees, but uh, what what are the what is our agreement with better uh, analysis about AAS members? Do they need to pay an entry fee on non-star party nights? I think that the agreement is that, and we would make it maybe just check what we have in writing with them. But I think it's that a member can be there at any time without paying. I think that's what I recall. That was my understanding too, I believe. Uh, so members are, are okay. Yeah, uh, Terry, I would just suggest if if you want to shoot this to Stephen and see if he has any answers. I mean, it's it's a it's a really quick turnaround time, and I don't I don't know if we can get answers from him by tomorrow night. But certainly, these are questions that we need to get answers to and uh, make sure that it's communicated to the members. Okay, I'll uh, I'll try and get a hold of him tomorrow morning then, and uh, I can I can respond to Ronan uh, as soon as I know something. Yeah. Uh, all right. Is, is uh, Sean in attendance? Our communications chair. Hey, nope. Uh, all right. Uh, Sean runs uh, uh, the website for us. Uh, he's the person to contact. You can contact him at communications at austinastro.org. 
If you need something to uh, go on the website, some announcement, uh, get on the events list uh, or whatever. Uh, if you have problems with your membership, uh, Sean's usually the first person to contact and he may get in touch with Patrick if you've got troubles paying or renewing your membership. Um, okay, uh, we don't have a slot on here, but we, I noticed we have Nathan with us who is our, uh, our newsletter editor. Nathan, anything you want to pipe up about? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay, thank you for all the wonderful work you do. No problem. <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll talk a little bit about equipment now. Greg, if you've got, uh, you got the floor. Okay, so uh, as has been previously discussed, we do have uh, loaner scopes. We've got quite a few of them in storage right now. Uh, the, uh, right now, they're pretty much all in storage uh, down, uh, down south near, uh, near Bryan. Um, we're planning on actually splitting those up to, uh, leave about half of them down there and, another, and the other half, uh, up, uh, here in North Austin near me so that we can, uh, better, uh, distribute them to whoever, whoever needs, uh, a scope. Um, if you want to use, you know, if you want to sign up for, to, to use a scope, um, we do, we do have that ability on the website, uh, and, uh, We'll, uh, we'll see about getting it out to you as quickly as possible. Um, other than that, uh, the only other major equipment is of course the subject of tonight's presentation and that's coming along really nicely and uh, should be ready before the next star party. I think okay. that's about it. All right. Uh, okay, one thing I wanna get with you, Greg, uh, we may need to cover this. Uh, well, the next, uh, maybe a little late on the next uh, EC meeting. I'll just throw it open uh, here. Uh, so we are going to talk a, a little bit about uh, Mark Johnson's estate sale. Mm -hmm. uh, he does have some equipment that be useful for the club to acquire. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about, uh, we are still trying to uh, set up a complete uh, electric electronic assisted astronomy package to be used mostly out at, at Perdinalis. Uh, and that is basically uh, a good astro video camera uh, on a fast, uh, uh, high quality refractor. Uh, we've got those components. Uh, we need, uh, right now we're borrowing Brian's uh, equatorial mount. We need a good tracking mount, uh, Jim, uh, and, uh, Mark has a couple of those that uh, might serve for us there. Uh, so uh, the, I, I'm not sure which budget this would go in, under if we uh, uh, want to allocate uh, some uh, money for that. Uh, it also depends on which mount we're talking about, how much money we're talking about, but he... Uh, he, uh, he does have a serious uh, mount. He has an Atlas, an Atlas. Uh, he has an EQ, an NEQ-6, which is a Skywatcher, an earlier version of that. And he's got uh, a uh, Celestron CGE. Uh, the way those are probably going to be priced out, I, I think uh, the EQ-6 and the CGE would be the most expensive and they would probably, they, they could sell from anywhere from $800 to $1,100, probably. Uh, the Atlas mount is an older mount. Uh, a new one is still about $1,500, but that might sell for uh, anywhere from four to 700 maybe. And the Sirius mount, uh, uh, just a couple of hundred dollars probably, but it might be a little light for what we're trying to do. Yeah. So I don't know, Greg. Do you have any advice on? Uh, I'd have to look at, it? look at the mount and see what kind of refractor you're talking about. Well, you've seen the refractor. It's the same thing we used out at uh, at Copper Breaks. So a four inch. Uh, okay. Yeah. U, uh, uh, NP one hundred one. Basically. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'm not familiar enough with those mounts to know which one would be the best one for that. Anybody on the meeting familiar with these mounts? Brian? Well, Atlas and the EQ6 is about the same. 
thing. Pretty close, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they will carry 40 pounds. So. Ryan, you're muted. Okay, unmuting. Terry, latest update from Dawn. She just got to a place where she can do a presentation. She's looking for a quiet spot where she has found a hot spot. I told her about another 15 minutes because it's still not quite 8.30 yet, and we're still discussing stuff. Okay. I All do right, not know where on the road she is. As for these mounts, yeah, <laughs> I agree. But just from what I've read and seen about them, mechanically, they're the same. In fact, Terry, you and I were looking at them, and the panels on them are even the same. Yeah. So, yeah. The one's white and one's be, black. If it can be rigged up and adjusted, they use the same software and, and driver and hand package that um, – hand driver package that my mount uses. Mine's just slightly newer and up-to-date is all. It's the same, same stuff, though. Uh, so either of those would probably support anything solid. Yeah, the CGE is, would be one that carries a lot bigger load, but I would stay away from the Celestron personally. Skywatcher makes the Atlas. So the Orion Atlas is made by Skywatcher. So those are basically the same two. Okay. So Skywatcher, uh, the Atlases are very popular. They're uh, notably a pretty rock solid arrangement. A lot of people that have them, you, you hear about it and they tend to sell very quickly on cloudy nights and most people get rid of them, not because there's anything wrong with them, but because they age out and those things are heavy. Yep. You were talking about the EQ? Yeah, EQ6 Atlas. and the Atlas, they're both the same though, but yeah, same, same no, that's what he's talking about. Essentially, that's it. They're, they're quite heavy, so that's yeah. the biggest complaint. But they're they're notably very good and upgradable because they're they're popular enough. There's things you can put inside and upgrade and mod them to do what you want. Okay, here's one challenge. Uh, each of those uh, mounts, the Atlas, uh, EQ, and the CGE, uh, they age. Yeah, we were talking about that. somebody was talking over me. Uh, somebody has the YouTube channel maybe uh, turned up a little bit. We're getting some feedback. Okay, so one challenge. Uh, Mark uh, used uh, – uh, he usually would use those on fixed piers. Uh, when he went portable with them, uh, he only had one tripod he used, which was a Mead Giant Field tripod. The same thing that you would put under a 12 or 14-inch Mead LX200. Uh, he had adapters made for the Atlas and the EQ to sit on uh, that really, uh, a really giant field tripod is overkill, uh, I think, for, for uh, anything maybe except the CGE. But it would be a very stable uh, uh, imaging platform. Uh, I think it's uh, for the uh, electronically assisted uh, astronomy that we want to do for outreach, it's dang big and heavy to set up. I guess if it would uh, uh, better analysis, uh, then uh, we could uh, uh, wheel it out and uh, have it kind of pre-set up. Wouldn't be too much problem, but if we're gonna take this around, uh, drive around anywhere, that's a pretty big tripod to be carrying around for just that purpose. Uh, good news there is we, the club has its own uh, uh, giant field tripod. The uh, 12 inch that's currently in the observatory was originally mounted on a, a giant field tripod. So we have that one, which actually has a set of wheelie bars. Uh, so maybe we ought to think about taking that tripod out to uh, Paternalis and we could mount one of those mounts on it and use that for EAA for the time being. So we might also want to consider something for a more portable mount. Um, so if we're talking about spending something in the range of, uh, four to eight or $900 for a mount, uh, what do we need to, how do we budget for that? Uh, do we just take it, uh, out of member services, uh, put a, put a line item in the new budget. I see Domingo doesn't like that. Okay. I, I think that that's, that's just a one-time, uh, a request to the members, honestly. Um, it's under a thousand dollars, we can make the decision. Yeah, yeah. right. It's only okay. if it goes over a K buck that we need to go back to the General Assembly and get approval on it. Okay. Also, you could possibly divide it up because you could buy a portion of it now and then make another decision later on on optic or what have you to build a system up and use it. It doesn't all have to be done at once. Well, like I said, we've already, the club's already got the optic. Okay. 
So, all right. So uh, what I think I'll do is uh, I'm going to need some help evaluating these mounts. They haven't been put together and run up uh, in quite some time. Uh, so I may ask uh, for somebody to help me uh, do some setup on these, maybe on the giant field tripod for now. And, uh, or maybe uh, we do have a, 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 a tripod for that serious mount. So anyway, uh, find out what, uh, how these things are working and see if they'll suit our purpose there. And then uh, we'll uh, probably look at acquiring one of those mounts from Mark. Let me see if I can find some information about those, especially with that specific panel and year that they were made. There's probably some pretty good support on uh, cloudy nights. Hey, hey Terry, um, of, of the uh, inventory, the, um, the estate inventory, I, I'm, I was more of seeing of the eyepieces because we have those large telescopes that have been donated to us, but we don't have eyepieces for them. Uh, we know we have the eyepieces for the one we had at Canyon of the Eagle, so those belong to that telescope. So if we can get some of the eye, good eyepieces for the other big telescope, uh, that would be nice. That would be complete the set so that we can have good eyepieces. My thoughts exactly. Yep, I would agree. Uh, we can probably uh, set some of those aside uh, for the club to acquire. Uh, the uh, basic pricing scheme we're going to use for all of the eyepieces is uh, to discount them about 30-35% uh, off of current list price. Um, and uh, 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 just basically go with that. If they're going to the club, we might take knock off another 10% for being a, a, you know, a local sale and, and a legacy for Mark. So we could end up with the Mark Johnson box of eyepieces. <laughs> Well, that would be good because all right, we'll have some discussions about which ones we might want to pull for that. Okay. Okay. And filter sets, if there are any filter sets. Uh, there are uh, quite a few filters involved too. Okay. That would be great. Okay. Um, so uh, if uh, if Dawn is out right now, uh, we're still waiting for her. Her section on the out corner will probably just uh pass that up this week uh, so august is when we generally present our budget for the year uh, and uh, our, our basic uh, modus operandi there is to take all of our budgeted items and uh, uh, basically uh, create a new budget from the existing budget and see if any of those numbers need to be adjusted. But um, we uh, uh, need to present that in, in July for an August vote. Is that right, Joyce? You're muted. The EC, the EC looks at it in July for an August vote by the GA. Okay. Uh, so uh, we will do that at our EC meeting. Uh, and if, uh, if necessary, we may call another special meeting to put the budgets together so that we can show them to the uh, General Assembly in August. Uh, so items that we're gonna talk about uh, enhancing this go around, of course, would involve things we wanna do with Bad Wolf and uh, some of the things we were talking about equipment just a, a few minutes ago. Uh, a lot of the other stuff is standard year in and year out uh, expenses. Okay. Uh, there could be some talk about revenue enhancement. Uh, it's been a long time since the club's done any kind of fundraiser. You go back a, a few uh, administrations ago, it was a kind of a central topic uh, about how we could uh, uh, really get involved in some serious fundraising. Uh, but uh, uh, I think your current administration is, is not really uh, um, hmm, skilled in that area. So anybody with ideas if, about how to grow the club, uh, if you are somebody uh, with skills in those areas, if you wanna to talk to us, uh, maybe present something to the EC, we'll certainly uh, entertain that. All right. Uh, we uh, normally have, well, let me uh, 
you guys notice that I put the uh, the estate sale uh, link for the catalog in the chat first thing in the meeting. If you didn't know, uh, I did know. Um, yeah, if you find the chat window and go directly to the top, you should see it. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, let me um, say that link. Okay, uh, for your entertainment, uh, I will. Uh, just go ahead and do a quick run through on that. Uh, you can ooh and awe over some of the stuff here. So we're sitting here under Mark inventory. Okay, put this down. Uh, this was Mark's very first telescope was an eight inch Orion. I believe it's an F4 actually uh, that uh, he used on a fork mount for several years. Uh, uh, he, he got a lot of good years out of this and he retired it once he got some other scopes uh, and uh, it's kind of a keepsake for him there. Uh, it would make somebody a great beginner scope. Uh, it's currently got a, a dovetail with inside an adapter that uh, Charlie Miller turned for him to fit it onto that particular binocular mount. Uh, but the, it's, a, it's a standard uh, Vixen dovetail, so all of the uh, smaller EQ type mounts would uh, be uh, fine for this scope. Uh, he uh, that'd, that'd be a great spotter scope if you got a, like a, a one meter light bucket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Jim Chandler operated that way with his uh, 25 and 30 inch. He put a, a, and Larry Mitchell does the same thing at Texas Star Party. He has an eight inch finder scope for his 36 inch daub. Uh, it just sits on the back of the mirror box. Uh, yeah, I guess if it came down to it, we could uh, talk about putting that on the Larry Forrest. <laughs> Johnson telescope. I don't know. As an F4, it might make somebody a good beginner for putting a camera in because it's fast yeah, enough for astrophotography. That is yeah, true. Put it on a put it on a little tracker mount and go for it. Mark had a set of Pentax eyepieces. Uh, these aren't the top shelf Pentax, but kind of the second shelf Pentax. Uh, this runs from 10 millimeters down to, to 3.5. So these are kind of higher mag intended for use in, in refractors. A uh, nice pair of Orion uh, 80 millimeter, uh, probably 11X binos with an easy finder on it. And a nice case. Just 20 by 80. Uh, either a, It's either a 11 by 80 or 15 by 80. I don't think it's, does it say 20? It says 20. Does, That's what it says on the does. case. Okay. Well, I, I believe in truth and in, in, uh, labeling, so that must be what it is. Okay. Uh, some Explore Scientific uh, eyepieces in the 68 degree field, I believe here. They could be the, the argon are probably 82 degrees and the nitrogen is a 68 degree field. Uh, a type four 12 meter, millimeter Nagler, which uh, are discontinued, uh, kind of hard to find and some, some people collect those. Uh, a set of eyepieces, matched eyepieces for bino viewer. Uh, Mark was really fond of put, using bino viewers in his uh, refractors and occasionally in the back of, uh, of his Mead SCT. He's got a pair of matched uh, uh, 16 millimeter Naglers and 24 miller, millimeter panoptics. And then he has a 26, 82 degree Nagler and 17, so, which are nice wide field eyepieces at medium powers. Uh, I have to tell you though that uh, the, uh, the pan optics and the Naglers and the final viewers have been spoken for by Jack Estes. A William Optic set of bino viewers with a set of uh, several uh, William Optic matched eyepieces uh, 20 millimeters, 15 millimeters uh, and a, a pair of 11 millimeter Naglers. Uh, some more explore scientifics. Uh, these uh, he also has a couple of planetary Burgess TMB eyepieces. Those are uh, specifically geared for planetary observing. Not too many glass elements in them. 
high contrast uh, field of view is, is not all that great, but it's uh, sharp as attack from, uh, from end to end. Uh, 2.5x power mate uh, and a 14 millimeter 82. Nope, this is, yeah, I think an 82 degree. Uh, it's an 82. Yeah. A uh, pair of overwork, and I think this must be the 11 or, the, or 15 power. Uh, no, this is a 70 millimeter. Uh, that would be a 15X. Yeah, Beth has actually sold those to a dear friend of hers. Uh, we have a Mark IV uh, Bader Hyperion 8 to 24 zoom, which is a great eyepiece. Explore Scientific uh, uh, Power Mate. Barlow type and a 24 millimeter, 82 degree. Terry, how do you get into the bidding? Uh, <clears throat> right now, uh, you just need to let me know if you're interested in some of this and I will put you at the top of the list for interested in, in, in that particular item. Uh, I'm interested in that Bader. I wasn't really planning on having a bidding war on these, uh, kind of uh, first come. Uh, I'd like to buy that beta. Okay. Uh, drop me an email uh, saying you're, you're interested in it. Uh, okay. And it's, it's kind of going to, the price is, like I said, we're going, we set a kind of a fixed price of about uh, 30, 30, 35% off the list for most of these eyepieces. Uh, Sounds good. Okay. Uh, I will flesh out the catalog with prices on it at some point, uh, unless it all sells out before then. Uh, a nice set of uh, medium or uh, short fo shorter focal length uh, Explore Scientifics, another Barlow. Uh, a set of uh, Teleview, uh, very short focus Naglers, 2.5 up to 5 millimeter, 7 millimeter. A uh, 14 millimeter Delos that has already been, I think uh, somebody on the meeting has already snatched that one up. Uh, 22 uh, Type 4 Nagler. A set of Bader Hyperion eyepieces, uh, which are uh, not very expensive. They're kind of medium grade, but they're high quality, good bang for the buck. Uh, this would be a great beginner set for somebody with a first scope, like a, a, an 8 or 10 inch daub or uh, you know, a, a, a uh, like up to a four inch or five inch refractor. Even if it's an Acromat, these would be great eyepieces for an Acromat refractor. Uh, some, uh, uh, is that the same thing? Yeah, I believe so. Just a larger picture of the same thing. Okay. Uh, he used those eyepieces on his uh, six inch uh, Astrotech uh, Acromat which actually he sold to me several years ago. I'll put that up for sale if anybody is interested in a six inch Acromat. And these are the Oberwerk uh, 80 millimeter binoculars with an easy finder on them. Uh, not even sure what this is. I think this was uh, part of an astrophotography setup. Uh, this is something I'm probably going to acquire for the uh, EEA setup or EAA setup. Uh, it needs a guide scope, a little 60 millimeter guide scope here. Uh, we'll probably part out the two inch diagonal separate, keep these eyepieces for this guide scope. Uh, that is a uh, pistol uh, uh, red dot, well, uh, rectical finder there. Uh, he had a couple of those. Uh, hand controller for one of the mounts, uh, not exactly probably the serious a uh, little mead kit here with a mead diagonal and some eyepieces that he used with the, the meads there uh, this is a illuminated rectical eyepiece uh, that's high, very high quality for illuminated rectical eyepiece uh, could have some astrophotography uses uh, okay. uh, I'm buying this eyepiece uh, for my 25 inch daub. Uh, the rest are available, 14 millimeter, 100 degree, 27 panoptic and a 4.782 degree. Uh, a set of Delos, uh, I don't know, nobody's spoken for those yet. So six, 4.5 and 3.5 millimeter Delos. 
uh, 28 and 18, I don't know what degree eyepieces those are. A set of Mead eyepieces. Uh, uh, these are uh, in both ultra wide and super wide angle here. Uh, the ultra wides are 84 degrees. Uh, and that would include this 14, the 6, 7, and the uh, not the 18. Oh, the 8.8 .8 is an excellent eyepiece. And for some reason, he's got a Celestron 2X Barlow in there. Uh, he had uh, half a dozen laser pointers ranging up to uh, half a watt. This is his 80 millimeter uh, William Optic uh, that uh, was a finder on his Tech 140 for a while until he got a 72 millimeter William Optic. Uh, this is a doublet with a fluorite lens. It's very highly corrected. Uh, I wouldn't call it a full APO, but it would make a nice uh, uh, wide field uh, imaging setup, uh, especially with that fo beefy focuser on it. So anybody starting in astrophotography thinks they want to go wide field, uh, this scope's probably going to go for, uh, you know, uh, 250 to 350. And that focuser is almost worth that, probably. Uh, some Paradigm eyepieces. Good starter uh, set. Good starter set. But, uh, a high quality William Optic inch and a quarter diagonal. Uh, another hand controller for one of the mounts. Uh, those send scans, I believe those are for the, uh, the Sky Watcher and the Orion. Uh, that's no, they the work on the work on the Atlas. I had an Atlas. Yeah, yeah that's that's the same thing. SenScan uses uh, the Orion Atlas and the uh, Skywatcher. Apparently, he needed to keep a double gauge, a double barrel uh, <laughs> white laser pointer to help set him up. <laughs> double barrel laser pointer. Okay, a thirty-five millimeter pan optic, which is a workhorse eyepiece for a lot of people that like flat fields. Oh, wonderful eyepiece. And a nice Astrotech two inch quartz diagonal to go with it. William Optical two inch quartz dielectric diagonal. And another 60 millimeter finder, similar to the one that was in the other kit. Uh, a pair of 82 degree, these are uh, William Optic eyepieces, the Yuan family. Not very familiar with them. Uh, with a four millimeter, and I can't read what the other one is right now. Uh, those would probably be an easy way to get into some wide angle eyepieces. They're, they're not going to be very uh, expensive. Seven millimeter? Yeah, might, maybe. It's, probably that was a, a, pa a pair of four and or something. I, I don't know. It's a four and a seven, it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a six millimeter uh, TMB planetary. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Mark's uh, Tech 140, uh, very highly corrected uh, ap APO, uh, for a three or four inch, I forget what size, uh, feather touch focuser in the back. It was Mark's pride and joy. And he didn't get to use it nearly often enough, so it hasn't, uh, it's had an easy life. This is his 130 millimeter TMB Thomas Back uh, signature uh, series. Uh, you may not know who Thomas Back was, but he was uh, a high powered up and coming optician uh, with a great line of telescopes. He passed away prematurely at the age of 50 about seven years ago. Uh, and uh, this was one of his, his nice uh, smaller, uh, well, it's not small, this is a a pretty hefty 130 millimeter, so that makes it what 5.1 inch uh, apple. Uh, there's the, the how much are you asking for that one? Question How much is that going for? The 130 millimeter? Uh, the uh, prices that we've seen on Astro Mart and Cloudy Nights run from uh, 28 to 35. So uh, that could be negotiable. We should look at what condition it's in and uh, how it compares to some of those on, that have been sold on, on uh, those sites. Uh, this is the 12-inch giant field tripod. 
these are three inch diameter legs. Uh, so the tripod itself probably weighs 45 pounds, if not more. It's a beast. This is the 10 inch uh, Me uh, F10 ACF that Mark uh, carried on that. Uh, and on top, it's got a 60 millimeter William Optics uh, finder is another little Apple chromatic finder, uh, which uh, uh, it's a little, this is a little long uh, or slow for some astrophotography work, but if you want to do long focal length astrophotography, you can find the Mead uh, focal reducers, uh, 6.8 and 3.3, uh, to bring that F number down for uh, faster astrophotography. Uh, and he had a Celestron project going. It is an older Celestron SCT uh, with uh, uh, a uh, moonlight focuser on the back of it. Uh, I don't know that he ever put it into use. Uh, I'm not sure what his plans were for it. Uh, but this is an 11 inch and uh, it's probably going to go fairly inexpensively if somebody wants to uh, try and make use of it. This is the NEQ6 mount that we were talking about. It has an upgraded ADM saddle uh, plus the original saddle. Both those saddles I think will hold uh, either a Vixen or a Lozmandy mounting plate. Uh, this tripod uh, and two uh, parallelogram mounts, so these would be good to buy with those 80 millimeter binoculars. This is his uh, Sirius uh, 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 German equatorial mount, uh, the tripod for it. This is a nice wooden custom box that his father-in-law ma made for it. This is the Atlas mount, again with an ADM uh, plate. An adapter, I think that's the adapter for the giant field tripod, uh, or possibly it was a peer adapter. Um, the uh, Red Oak Observing Chair, originally owned by John Huntsberger that Mark inherited, Cat's Perch. You can get your, your tush about uh, four and a half or five feet off the ground. <clears throat> Another observing chair. Uh, this is the CGM mount. It's an original CGM. Uh, Daniel Maloney upgraded it for Mark. He replaced several of the RG, uh, R, RJ um, connectors with Molex connectors. Uh, apparently that was a weakness of, of the original mount when the connectors uh, tended to, to degrade. Uh, so uh, he's got uh, Molex connectors for the hand controller, the, the uh, deck and uh, and uh, RA uh, motors, uh, an AUX1 and AUX2, I don't really know what they're used for. Uh, this one, uh, this is probably the largest carrying capacity of all the mounts he's got there. Uh, I think his intent was to also use this on the giant field tripod. Uh, Terry, the rig you and I have been using, my, my uh, setup uses that same set of connectors. They're very reliable. Uh, yeah, yep. And that's about it. Um, there are boxes of really smaller components. Uh, uh, some of those, uh, some of the filters, uh, like the L3 filters, uh, we might try and uh, sell those. Uh, they can, the two inches can easily bring a hundred dollars on if they're the right ones. Uh, other odds and ends, tube rings, uh, uh, mounting plates, uh, probably, all together, 40 or 50 pounds of small pieces like that. Uh, but uh, 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 we may post pictures of those as kind of a grab bag kind of thing. Otherwise, uh, this is the main main catalog here. Any uh, questions or comments? Okay. Uh, do we have Don yet, uh, Brian? Terry, latest update on Dawn. I just heard from her. She's not getting a very connected, good connection where she's at, but she was asking about uh, um, a what's up this month in astronomy, which I do have one prepared. And she is going to try to make it home. She is not far from home. She has the presentation. She just needs a decent connection from the place where she was. Okay. 
Uh, we'll go with that. If you want to go ahead and uh, share, let me see. Are you co-host, uh, Brian? You will be in a second. You may have to make me a co-host, and it'll take me a second or two here to get it together. But once once I get transferred over. Okay. <clears throat> are, are I co host? You are. I are co host already. So let me see. Remind me how to do this. I got to go well, find you. Share. Go share screen. Share screen. Where are you? All right. Share screen. Now, when I get to the screen where I'm at on my computer, I have to manually change from one, one uh, window that I have open to another if memory serves. Okay, what are we seeing now? I uh, see some content. Yeah. Uh, NASA approves an asteroid hunting space telescope to continue development. Is that correct? Yeah. <clears throat> All righty. Well, oh, see. welcome to What's Up This Month in Astronomy. There's some nifty neato stuff going on. Let me tell you, I've been reading a little of this and that. And this most recent one, look at this artist's conception. Okay, this is Neo Surveyor, and this is a proposed idea. NASA wants to continue hunting asteroids. This is kind of important. It's a big topic. We hear about it even in mainstream news, whether accurate or not. We still hear about it. It's talked about by a lot of astronomers, a lot of people uh, uh, working in the business and concerned with things that are orbiting or may get close to Earth. So since that next big one could be around the proverbial corner, this infrared space telescope is designed to help advance NASA's planetary defense effort. Yes, they use those terms. NASA has proved the Near Earth Object Surveyor Space Telescope, NEO. Hey, they did a good job naming this. I got to give them points. That was a little better than some of their other naming jobs. And it's to move to the next phase of the mission development uh, after a successful mission review, authorizing the mission to move forward into a preliminary design known as key design. The infrared space telescope is designed to help advance NASA's planetary defense efforts by expanding our ability to discover and characterize potentially hazardous objects and asteroids, comets, and what have you that come within 30 million miles of Earth's orbit. So this is one of those things that we're going to be able to watch develop over a period of time that is going to help us better understand what we are facing from far out there. Okay, did I just change screens? Are you seeing that? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, NASA's Juno is going to get a nifty, neato, close look at Jupiter's Ganymede. So since it's been going close by, and as Ganymede, I believe it rotates, if I'm not mistaken, you get this lovely mosaic where it's mapping it the same way it did Cirrus and, and Vesta when we when we sent um, the Dawn spacecraft out and it orbited one for a good while. Originally it was uh, Vesta, I believe, and then they came off of that orbit and they went out to Cirrus. Well, as a result, we have very good 3D computer models of what they look like. So during its uh, mission, Juno is going to be doing very similar things to every moon that it can get a good look at, especially ones that we have particular interest in. In this case, it's going to be Ganymede. Ganymede is one of the ones that's big enough that when you look up and see the four Galilean moons, well, guess what? You can see Ganymede. It's one of them. So it's a very easy one to spot. And Hang on just a second. I'm having to pull up some information here. All right, shoot from the hip. Don't you love it? This is impromptu astronomy at its best. One of the first gas giant orbiters back to flybys will provide a close encounter with it after over 20 years. It's been a while since we flew anything close to it. So this is gonna be Monday, June 7th. It's already passed. Uh, some of this information is gonna be a little bit dated, but at least you can say they've got something to look at now. This is supposed to uh, yield as much insight into the moon's composition, ionosphere, magnetosphere, and the ice shell. Ice shells are of particular interest to NASA in recent years because it does 
you know, increase the possibility that we might find potentially life, which seems to be one of the biggest things that uh, everyone is looking for. It's one of the big questions on everyone's lips of, okay, there's a big orbiting something out there. What is the possibility of life? Ice could be an ice shell on the outside, and it could very easily have potentially an ocean or something deep underneath it. Juno's measurements of the radiation environment near the moon will also benefit future missions to the Jovian system. Since when you go with any probe to... Um, to uh, Jupiter, you're dealing with a lot of radiation, very high. That's the reason why Juno has uh, kind of a limit on its mission. They know about how many times that they can swing far or wide and then come in very fast and go past it because it breaks down um, some of the shielding and things get torn apart and other things electrically and at the microscopic level begin to break down and we'll start losing instrumentations at some point. In theory, if they kept doing it forever, uh, the spacecraft would uh, eventually cease to function because it's uh, very hard on the electronics. It's the Ganymede is bigger than the planet Mercury, and it's the only moon in the solar system with its own magnetosphere, which is really kind of cool. You don't usually see much information on that. Let me run this quick clip. So here's a quick look at what they got from USGS when they scanned it. So uh, they're using the colors to tell different uh, heights, I believe. It's uh, altitudes that they're looking at. Yeah, global color mosaic. Pretty cool. So Juno is definitely giving us a lot more data, even though you don't hear about it so much on a day-to-day -day basis like we did when it first arrived. I look up something on it every so often, and I think it's pretty cool you find something new, you know. Um, here's one that's interesting. I read about this. So they got a chance, now that we've had a year's worth of data, to look from space at where our greenhouse gases are, what they're like, what they're doing, what they're affecting. And mostly we get a better look from, from satellites. So, you know, I have somebody go, hey, why is NASA spending all the money, put all the satellites up there? Guys, that is how we are getting a better look at the earth upon which we live. It's amazing how much we have learned by simply looking at it from what's functionally the uppermost part of the atmosphere. So let me see if I can pull this one up. Just bear with me a second here. All righty. Coming on up. Local lockdowns brought on fast global <laughs> ozone reductions. This is what Glass has found. When lockdowns during the coronavirus uh, pandemic cut local nitrogen oxide emissions, the effect on ozone pollution was unexpectedly rapid. Let me run this for a minute 53 here. Can you hear it okay? I don't hear anything. No. no sound. No sound. Let me take a look and see if I can make that work. Yeah, I guess it's not going to transmit over. Uh... They're just playing music in the background, just so you're wondering. But look at what it's saying on there. Eight months, they got a 2% drop. In 15 years of aggressive uh, standardization, they were not able to achieve that. Worldwide reduction in ozone. I had been hearing things about this for a while that um, there had been some rather dramatic changes unexpectedly so that was being measured in the first three or four months after the COVID lockdown began. People weren't driving, factories were not running, things were forced to come to a stop and we stopped emitting a lot of things. But how quickly it changed is what the surprise was, how measurable it was. Something to think about. 
Okay. I think it's because I have my headset on. It's probably why you were not hearing it. And like I said, it was just music. No one was speaking, but could everybody read that okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, guess who else is fixing to get real busy? NASA's Perseverance rover begins its first campaign. Now, as you may recall, we did talk about the little helicopter, the Ingenuity helicopter, and it's made several flights. And I don't know if they're done with those. I haven't specifically seen that anywhere saying, hey, we're done flying yet. But they did several flights to establish what they wanted to learn. And so its job was to carry it there, deposit it on the ground, back away from it some 50 plus meters, and then monitor what it does, as well as relaying all of the, uh, the firmware and the instructions and stuff to the, uh, the helicopter. So our six-wheeled scientist who is set, uh, heading out to Jezero Crater to explore the lake bed, because it is a delta and because there looks just like from space, there was rivers flowing there at one point. So ancient signs of microbial life, that is priority one. So let's see what we have here on this. Got a minute 40. I'm going to go ahead and do a quick unplug if I hear anybody speaking on this. Okay, right now, I'm going offline. So I don't know if you can hear me on this or not. We can hear you. Louder. <laughs> okay, can anybody hear me? Yep, yeah. I hear you loud and clear. Okay, so I've gone off my headset here. And what we have, what it was listening to was the sounds of Mars, that low sound of wind on Mars. So I'm not hearing anything coming out of here. So I don't guess there's anything they're talking about. It's strictly, uh, strictly uh, banners and stuff coming up. So the Perseverance rover is about to start its commissioning phase and doing its business where it does more than just shepherd a helicopter. It's testing oxygen generation. Now that was done with the MOXIE instrument. I remember seeing a lot of the details in a lot of these instruments before they ever went there. Uh, the demonstration flights, of course, are done. The cameras took many, many images and took its first audio track of Mars. Uh, these are the quality of images that we are getting back with these newer cameras. That is incredible. It, that could be someplace on Earth. So they're going to put the uh, put the original helicopter business, as they said, uh, its location in the rearview mirror. Go hit the road, said Jennifer Trosper, Perseverance Project Manager. There is so much unique geology to see. Let me see if there's anything else down here on this. Here's the map. Okay, so we have our landing sites. And then it's going to run all around Jezero Crater. We've got Three Forks, Octavia E. Butler landing site. So I'm going to guess that they ran a short distance originally to Seta N and Seta S. And then these raised ridges, uh, what I don't know is how steep those are. So this, this uh, rover is designed to do a little bit of uh, steeper climbing. It should be able to handle some of the rockierness because they knew from the satellite images what it was they would be dealing with here in Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater, if you back out from this image a little bit more, you can see it looks tremendously like a delta from uh, planet Earth. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, I'm back on my headset now. Yes, I, my default has changed. I hear you. Okay, so the challenges along the way are expected to come from the sand dunes and the, and the, the mitten-shaped SETA unit. To uh, negotiate them, the rover is going to drive either on the crater floor, fractured enough and along the boundary between it, and the occasion calls for it. Perseverance will perform toe dip into the SETA unit, making a beeline for a specific area. There we go. Yes, it started up one of its many videos on the, uh, the launch and how they landed it and everything. This is the part I wanted to share with you is this mission is starting to uh, finish up with the chopper and we're going to go spend some time rolling around. So expect, you know, they're going to discover some interesting things we may hear about. Hey, that's potential life. You know, keep your fingers crossed. You never know. Could be something totally, totally kicking. Um, 
The first science campaign will be complete when the rover returns to its landing site. At that point, Perseverance will have traveled between 1.6 and 3.1 miles. Now, let's go back over what we know from previous uh, rover missions. You know, they'd be set typically for about 90 days, give or take. And of course, we had some, we had one of them survive 14 years. So they have post or potential post missions after this most important mission is run and it's gone to all of the locations where they wish to check and they've picked up the samples. Those will be picked up via robot. They will be sealed. They will be either left on the rover or I can't remember. I think they're going to be dropped near the site and the rover will leave them in a little package so that they can be easily retrieved by a spacecraft in the future. Designs of which are already on the drawing board to pick that up at a future time and return the vials of the various samples from this area back to Earth for analysis in our own labs, which is where we run our best chance of actually finding something uh, at, that is a, a potential for life. So, but as I was saying, let's let's assume this is 90, 90 days or thereabouts. When this when this mission is over and it returns back to that site, there may well be other missions where they go, all right, everything's working. Uh, we've got this much left and these instruments work. Uh, let's pick a direction. And they may have other missions. This one may very well end up roving all over um, all over Mars, picking up future missions for as long as it functions until the next one you know, comes off the drawing board. And that is what's up in astronomy this month. Cool stuff. Thank you, Brian. That's great. Excellent. Tim, Cass, look at you. <laughs> you came up big, just like in the front of center of my screen. How'd you do that? Because I spoke, I guess. It likes you. So do we have Don with us? <laughs> Let me check in. I just got a message here two seconds ago that came through. Just heard Don's yes. laugh. All right. Uh, she just got let in. Yes, got Hi. Hi. All right. Uh, All right, so are we ready to go? Yes, you are. Okay. Well, I can, I can pour a couple more plates if you need another three or four minutes. No, no, we're good. We're good. I think it's set. Okay. Um, so to give folks some context about the Connex, um, let's see. So a little timeline. Back in August of 2017, we decided to part ways with Canyon of the Eagles, which is out on Lake Buchanan. Uh, in Burnett County, and we needed an alternative site to start holding star parties, particularly public star parties. And so August of 2017, we elected to part ways with Canyon of the Eagles, and we started conversations with the interpretive ranger at Inks Lake, Lindsay Pinnell, and the interpretive ranger, um, I can't remember Stephen's last name for a moment. Help me out here, guys. Oh. Uh, Garmin, Stephen Garmin. Garmin. Stephen Garmin out at Paternalis. Garmin, yes, Garmin, yeah. Um, and we chose these locations because of their general proximity to Austin, being uh, north and south locations, giving us an opportunity to kind of widen our, our field of individuals and public uh, access to star parties. And in March of 2018, we hosted our first star party with Inks Lake. And then the following month, we hosted our first star party with Paternalis Falls. And this went on back and forth, alternating parks for some time. Actually, we were just hitting, I think, two years when COVID struck. Um, so a year later, after our negotiations began, we approached Paternalis Falls about the prospect of putting in an observatory. And being Texas Parks and Wildlife and a lot of red tape, uh, we weren't able to put in a permanent structure, but we were allowed to put in a semi-permanent structure. And thus began our search for a 40 foot shipping container, which eventually uh, Greg stepped in and took over that daunting task and negotiated arrangements. And uh, in April, I believe that's correct, of last year. April 15th. <laughs> Tax day. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The Connex was dropped. So let me go ahead and share my screen here and let's get going. <laughs> All right. 
So unless anyone comes up with an alternative name, uh, this is sort of the one we've settled on. It seemed rather apropos with it being uh, Pedernales Falls State Park. So we've been uh, calling it Falling Star Observatory. And for those of you who want a little context, so this is sort of your downtown Austin area here. And you've got uh, 71 heading out this direction. And right here on the Pedernales River, just before you Actually, get to- Actually, well, I know it's 290, not 71. 71 oh, is the Northern route. Okay, thank you. 290, uh, just outside of Dripping Springs before you get to the turnoff for Johnson City, you get to Pedernales Falls. And within Pedernales Falls State Park, they have this field here of which they've spent a fair bit of time constructing a 100 foot diameter henge uh, just outside of their equestrian area. So you can see that henge here. And right behind this barn, in this perfectly arranged space, which we fit just lovely, is our shipping container. And eventually we will actually have a pathway, a little gate mm -hmm. here. Yes? I'm going to interrupt, but are you actually sharing your screen? Oh, am I not? I see it. Yeah. Uh, I see it. Okay. Yeah, we're seeing it. Okay, that's good. I'm not sure what's wrong with me, but I'm not seeing it. So, are you, did you share it through the, uh, I change, don't change my view here. Okay. Exit. Can everyone else see it? Yes. Okay. So, I can so uh, just to give some context, this is about uh, about 1.2 miles in from the main gate. There's a turnoff here. Let me get my mouse. Uh, to, and then the bird blind area is here on your left. And if you keep following the road, this is a large parking area and part of their equestrian area. So behind this huge barn, we have our tiny little shipping container here. Um, and as I was mentioning, uh, eventually in the next, hopefully the next few months, uh, there'll be a gate installed right alongside where our container is, so a little gate here. And we're gonna have a pathway going out to the henge um, and hopefully two large sort of semicircle cutouts for our two large telescopes for the 24 inch and the 25 inch scopes to be situated. And then as we have in the past, we'll use the henge space for our public star parties. Um, but to get there, obviously there's been a bit of work. Uh, Greg situated the shipping container to have this fantastic roll up door here for us. Um, but for the most part, as you can tell, when it was dropped, it was bare bones. Um, so from pretty much April to July, Greg and Brian worked on initial framing of the inside, putting all this you see here. Add anything, because I didn't come on in, until, until August, but if there's anything you want to add sort of about this first few months. It was very hot. <laughs> it was very hot. And it was, you know, honestly, it was it was mostly just figuring out how to work in the confined space itself. Yeah, there were still the concerns about COVID, and we decided that just the two of us practically stepping on each other was as much as we needed initially. And it was really just setting up vertical, horizontal, and how we were gonna do the internal structure because everything had to start from there. That's what supports everything that's inside. Yeah. As you can see at this far end here is this, this lonely little cutout, which uh, as you'll see as we progress, eventually has an air conditioning unit, but did not for the vast majority of the 2020 summer months. No, it did not. No, no, none of the summer months. We got it in when the when the, <laughs> when we got the, it in the moment the weather turned. Yes, uh, yes. As soon as it got cold, that's when we got the air conditioner. So by August, mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the framing, especially on this end, had been put in. As did the original, uh, the initial structure of what would be our sort of electrical cabinet and general work cabinet. Uh, Brian drove up and got all of this wonderfully. Uh, inexpensive insulation that's been uh, have been used but fit our purposes perfectly uh, and that's started going in in place and you can kind of see the finished project product here of this far end this is the end that we started on with regards to insulation and with paneling um, and this beautiful job this cabinet these these men need to be really proud because it's just stunning 
I mean, these these pictures do not do it justice. The the stain work, the trim work, it's it's just top notch. So moving on to September, we had a lot more of the framing, and it's when we began sort of breaking off the space. So if you enter those uh, those rolling doors to your right hand side is a ten, what ten by eight foot room mm -hmm. that will be used to store the two large telescopes. But for now, at this point in time, it was just just framing and stringing along electrical when we could. By October, much more on the install of the air conditioning unit here, which. I will note works beautifully, especially when all the doors are closed. Um, and then that closed off room started, because you can see in the background in the photos here, it started getting a lovely uh, upper level of pegboard for storing of gear. And then our, our little buddy Groot came into the picture. Do you want to explain the uh, the root switching? What? <laughs> So the, uh, the the reason that we have the the Groot switch there is, is that it's a it's a battery cutoff switch uh, because we, we put in a uh, we put in a 110 volt uh, inverter to run off of the battery to give us uh, 110 volt AC um, without the generator uh, but it does have a standby current even when it's shut off so if we leave it sit you know for for a couple of weeks uh, without uh, it will, it, the, uh, battery. So we have to be able to to completely shut the, the battery off uh, once we pack up and, and leave, you know, for a month. So that's that's the only reason why we have to have that isolation switch in there. So of course, Greg mentioned that this was the root switch, so it's thus been named the Groot switch, yeah. and. You will see other various uh, Easter eggs hidden throughout this observatory now and once it gets finished. So come all to evidence, all evidence of our bad sense of humor. Hey, you know what? That's what happens when you leave three geeks to do all this. <laughs> <laughs> geeks and nerds, guilty as charged. Um, so here's when we really started getting the electrical in place. So you can see on this right hand side, we've got these wonderful light panels in here. This is our white lights. Um, and we started getting our exterior red lights in. Little little homage, a little uh, throwback to some uh, sort of vintage railroad-esque design here. Um, as you can see, we've more seen- More ship's lantern, I think. Oh, yeah, I guess, I guess more nautical, yes. Yes. Um, and reaching that far end wall with the paneling tons of fun side paneling not so bad roof paneling ceiling paneling that was a that was oh, less fun that was, yeah <laughs> oh, that, that was murder that was dirty work come december which honestly if you've got to do this kind of over the head strenuous work at least we did it during the cooler months um but you can see us installing the the paneling that's up along the ceiling and uh, covering this box here so this is the roll-up door so as it rolls up it rolls up into this box so we've Added some nice paneling to that, and get a sense of sort of what our uh, what our workspace usually looked like, which was typically insulation on one side, paneling on the other, narrow pathway in between, trying not to to trip over each other. Here's in January where things really started to gel, and you you can see just this amazing trim work that I, I think a lot of it is is lent to Brian, um, especially these these great corner meetings. They just mm -hmm. perfectly. You'll also get a sense that there's a bit of a steampunk bent to our design in here. So we utilize a lot of brass, a lot of copper, and a lot of pewter colors on here. So uh, this, all this trim up here and all the ceiling trim uh, is sort of that, that coppery uh, tone. And I, th I think if we were to have a nickel jar for every time we said trim, um, it trim. Probably would have paid for the observatory by now. <laughs> anytime, uh, anytime we had issue with you know meeting the the panel joints and it being a little too far off or something not quite coming together, it's like it's okay. We're we're gonna add trim. So was, trim. I think we even said it in unison quite a few times. Yeah. Yes, the the common phrases were trim and uh, when any of us try to be perfectionists, it was this is not a Swiss watch. So uh, <laughs> that was bantered around a lot. Yeah. 
February was fun. February was when we really started getting all the red lighting in place and began measuring and prepping for the uh, air conditioning ducting here, you'll see. Um, so this is all LED red light strip that's on a dimmer switch. Um, and this is sort of the, the nighttime view. We've got a little bit more with some daylight, but you can see here for the most part, it's, it's out of sight behind this ducting, which is great because it diffuses the light. So it's not bright um, and directly in your eyes. As you can mm -hmm. see, so the upper right hand corner, you know, you can't even see the lighting strips that's hidden so well behind this. Um, but it's it's sufficiently lit so you can really operate in here very easily um, in the dark with that red light backing to it. That's when we started getting heavily involved in the rest of the ducting work and in masonry work, stonework. Um, so by the time this observatory is finished and we launch it, it will be ADA compatible, um, which means it will have a sufficient ramp that will allow for wheelchair access or any other ADA access, which is, is exciting. And really huge props go to, to Greg for this design work. I'll have more pictures coming up here in a moment. Um, and this is his, his daughter, Michelle, who even put a little, little child slave labor in on it. Um, but especially up at the AC in the ducting area, you can see again, a lot of, a lot of a bit of a steampunk industrial look to it. So April's when the stonework really started to gel. So you can see we've got these steps, these shallow steps here to the left of the observatory. And then going off to the right is this nice wide ramp. And this will actually meet up with the pathway that the park will be installing. So it should be a fairly smooth transition from the pathway up into the observatory. And even, even so far as we've gotten this up over the lip, so there's not much of a, a bump going into the actual interior. Hey, Dawn. Yes. Hey, um, just a quick question. Uh, like if you're coming straight out from the rolling door, that edge looks like a pretty steep step down there. Are there any plans to maybe put some kind of railing or something? I'm just, with people in the dark, you know, they might step off that inadvertently. No bringing that up. Um, so what you'll see, you might see a little bit of it in a couple more slides. Um, okay. Greg has actually been uh, working on an install. So this will actually be all red light illuminated along the edge here and going down each side of the steps. So okay. it will be delineated. And I think we're actually even along the edge, we'll be using um, glow, glow tape or glow paint, um, but it will be very, very clearly defined. Um, yeah, that's that was definitely something that we we took note to when when putting this together is to make sure that nobody doesn't accidentally step off here it's not that high but of course in the dark and if you're not expecting it um right. it could be a little a little, a little jarring so yeah yes. it's, it's it's actually like a 16 inch drop there uh so here's where we started uh doing some work to make sure it stays cool inside so as you can see here we've got these the doors on the end have had these little wood pieces put in place and we've got what's called reflectix on these doors. So on the back doors and the end doors and on the rolling door as well. And as, as definitely, I know Brian can attest to, and I'm sure Greg can too, that uh, the moment we put that up, you could, you could feel the difference between the one door that was covered with the reflectix and the one door that was not. Um, because again, this is a, large metal box sitting out in the sun. It gets very hot very easily. Uh, so this will help to, to mitigate that temperature to regulate it because this back room uh, does not get really much airflow. It does not, it's not part of the AC system. Uh, so we wanna make sure we can control the temperature as much as conceivably possible uh, to keep those telescopes um, you know, as cool as we can. And uh, again, a little Little pop quiz if anybody can tell what what this little display up here might be from leaf on the wind <laughs> what is that or, or notably you know curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal for those of you who have seen firefly again our little geeky homage popping up so this is the most recent set of photos this is june we we just sort of uh, we're able to get back into the observatory after what three weeks of rain nonstop, pretty much. Um, Rainy and 
<laughs> if it rains, it's so mucky out there that even four wheel drive isn't really going to help you. Um, so this is this is pretty close to the finished product. We've got a desk back here uh, that will have a computer set up that we can connect to the television. Uh, for those of you who are ever out of Canyon of the Eagles and saw this lovely display here um, that held all of our paperwork and all of our flyers, that'll eventually get mounted. Um, over here, you see this finished sort of box that holds those roll up doors. This is actually eventually going to get a lovely display of clocks for all six time zones in the United States. Um, and here's a nice little, little preview of sort of what it looks like from, from the outside in the dark. And again, geeky homages. Greg, what are these two right here? Well, that's the end door, of course. Those are the end doors because they're <laughs> the end doors. So they're end door. <laughs> So uh, let me give you a little, let me jump down here. All right. So here's our little red light walkthrough. So this is outside um, alongside that ramp area, our steps leading up. So this is, this is actually, it was just last Sunday, about what, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, and just with, with our red lights on. So you can see we've got our our benches that we came from the old observatory. Here's our TV over here. It's going to get mounted up on the wall. Just over here's that enclosed room with a, a much better look at the end doors Your with love. both reflectics up. And then the amazing pegboard we have all along here, which will be highly utilized, I'm sure, for hanging equipment, hanging cords. Yeah. Oh, that's through this room. There's that air conditioning unit back there, this wonderful bench here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and kind of jump to the white light since I think you all kind of get the, the gist of how it, it looks. Actually, I'll wait to go through the door. So there you go. There's the outside. Um, we go. So here's our, our white light version. And these are these are some experimental red lights we are working with. We'll probably I think Greg's going to do some more research into finding some more adequate lighting for us. Uh, those lights have had new batteries that arrived today. They use oh. a nickel cadmium type cell. They are installed and sitting here on the bench in front of me right now. They're in perfect working order. And mm -hmm. having torn them apart, I have an idea how they work. It is entirely possible we can get more very similar to them and convert them over to 100% red. I've probably got a pile of those red lights in my garage. Great. Um, and I have to say, you know, it's it's only a 40 foot storage container, but it's rather remarkable just how long it takes to put in all that framing, to put in all the insulation, to put up the paneling, to put up the trim, um, you know, all the, all the electrical work. You know, it has, it has ample outlets, um, uh, switches between, you know, red light and white light. Um, you know, I, I think that when you all see this in person, I, I think, and at least I hope that you will all be pleased with the amount of work that has gone into this. Um, I think, I feel, I mean, I think I can speak for, for Greg and Brian when I say that we really put our hearts into every, every aspect. You're darn right it's great. I've stayed in hotels that weren't nearly as nice. <laughs> I will say, we, I, well, I, I can't really say me so much, but th there was definitely some work that went into sweeping and cleaning this up because it does not normally look this pristine. Um, we still have a, a fair bit of build outs and a, a fair bit of uh, bookshelves to, to build in and little bits and pieces left. But I, I don't know. I think aside from the, the painting of the outside, I, I put us, what do you think, guys, about 90 percent complete? Yeah, at least. I think I'd say we're getting close to that. We still have the solar panels to install, which will maintain our battery when no one is there. That way we'll have access to the low voltage, i.e. the red lights and things of that nature, yeah. which will not run the air conditioning. Uh, for now, the air conditioning can only be operated on its own separate circuit, specifically by a generator. 
which I still have to weld up a cage so that it can go live outside and be secure and chained up. And then you just, uh, we'll have a set of instructions. We'll train some people who can come out there and fire it up when need be and uh, turn on the air conditioning and have access to 110. And then of course, as it starts to get dark in the evening, then we'll shut off the generator and switch over to red. And of course the automatic lights, the yard lights will sit there and they'll be self-maintained. So that's the basic idea to make it as as off-grid capable and self-sustaining as possible. Mm -hmm. That looks pretty awesome. Thank you for doing all that work. One yeah. of the things I'm working on right now is a is a start up and shut down procedure, which yeah. will be uh, taped to the inside of the the uh, left hand cabinet door where the electrical cabinet is, because uh, we've got uh, options in. We've got a, a selector switch in there to go from either the generator or or the uh, inverter, and then we've also got uh, let's see. Uh, then I'm also going to have a, a map of the actual connector blocks within the, uh, uh, within the, within the break or within the, the circuit box in case anybody but me has to do any debugging in there. <laughs> I mean, I know where everything is, but you know, I don't, I don't guarantee that, uh, I'll be the only one that ever has to, uh, to fix something. So uh, I'm going to document every, where all of the wires are landed and, and what circuits they go to. Yes. Yeah, right there, I, I, think. I want to say that um, Joyce and I and Jamie went out there the other weekend and we were all very impressed with the work that you three have done on this. Definitely. Both the hard work and the creativity in how it's designed and put together is exemplary. Mm -hmm. well, we appreciate that. Indeed. I've got one more thing to share with you guys. Um, just for those of you who may not know where it's situated, let me uh, open this up. And this is some wonderful music, care of our very own guy dude. Oh yeah, this was your, sl your slow roll in. <laughs> Greg was stuck behind me while I was taping this. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, awesome. Great. Great. Terrific. Cl clearly, there were no street lights or strip malls uh, close to the uh, site. No. <laughs> <they're not. laughs> 
Yeah, there's there's nothing with lighting close to the site. You're well uh, inside the park. There is a pretty bright sports stadium about uh, maybe Crow Flight, seven miles away. I don't that, like as I was leaving on Sunday, you know, it, it was really apparent just how very little lighting there is. Um, and, and part of my, part of the work I do now, uh, like employment work, is to uh, partner with state parks to get them certified via the IDA. So that's gonna be something I'm gonna be working on with Pedernales Falls, um, hopefully in the coming months to start that process to get them IDA certified as a dark sky site. Hey, you guys ready for a phase two assignment? <laughs> phase two. I'm kind of looking forward to having my Saturdays back. What did you have in mind? Uh, two 20 footers configured as a double wide with roll off roof. After summer. Oh, I love wow. That. After that... summer. Yeah, well, you got some spare time. Yeah. Huh. Think about how you might put one together. Uh, where are you I'm thinking about that, Terry? For, for what site? <laughs> yeah, where? I'm thinking about next to this one with some kind of walkway, but put the telescopes in there permanently set up. Roll the roof off. So I am. Um, Terry, do you not remember how long it took to get that MOU? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 do you, and do you remember exactly how we got the MOU? Yeah. I refresh my memory. It, it was uh, what, uh, two years of back and forth. Yeah. And, cool. and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it actually happened, what, a month and a half after COVID when the regular person who was supposed to sign it off wasn't available and somebody else stepped in and did her job for her. You gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> you know let's let's get that let's get that cement pad uh, and pathway laid out before. Yeah. Uh, before Sound, sounds like you found the right person to bribe there. So <laughs> that sounds like a fantastic idea, Terry. We got to get that other stuff done. But I'm thinking, yeah, we got a lot of welding and a lot of securing. We got to cut. There's so much welding involved with a rig like that. But I don't know anybody else who's done it. Hold uh, off on the bribing. This is being recorded. <laughs> yeah. Well, as as far as as far as uh, welding two of those units together. Uh, there are uh, there are at least two companies that I know of here in Austin that do just that uh, for uh, for making uh, container homes. Yeah, I've seen container homes with triple wides. Well, this is all very doable, but it's usually something you find out how to do on YouTube rather than paying someone because they because we can't deliver them that way. They have to be brought out there and yeah. then put together and figure out how to cut the roof off yeah. and make the roll off. It's a, it's a construction on site with a lot of cutting, welding. A lot, I've seen people just cut them with four and a half inch grinders. So as far as that goes, yeah doable but definitely a future project guys i have another telescope to build and this is going to take me some time i need my weekends back yeah all right uh, well great job guys well everybody think... mark G july 17th on your calendar that'll be our big grand opening we hope uh still yeah. just the slightest little bit of doubt in my mind but i think it's probably going to work out for july the 17th and actually uh, Brian and, and Don and Greg, that may actually, it may actually be helpful that we had to move things from June the 26th to July the 17th, because that give, gives you a little bit more time for some of the... Yeah, a little more breathing room to finish up. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, will we be able to leave either of the telescopes out there? Yes. I see no reason why we can't have one or both of those scopes out there before the 17th. We do have a ramp, a portable ramp that goes in the back, probably would use a little more build up on the, uh, the base that we have out there, but the ramp is specifically designed to be able to roll the telescopes in and out. Uh, one of them possibly completely assembled, so we may not even have to take them apart. We just put the handles on them, roll them in there if all goes well. So to answer David's question, uh, he was asking, will July 17th be on Zoom? Unfortunately not 
likely. Um, we need to figure out what kind of equipment and technology we have to drop a router out there because right now there is almost no connectivity whatsoever. Uh, we managed to get the occasional texts pop through or calls if we're walking around the area, but otherwise there there is no chance of, of having a stable Zoom call out there until oh, we can do something yeah. that gets us connectivity. Let's get a beta test license for Skylink. Well, there are actually some options along those lines, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Uh, so, uh, the uh, are we going to do any other exterior painting, and, and uh, what's that going to look like? Um, most yes. of that is is going to get done, but it's uh, it's pretty much been pending a drop in the humidity, yeah. which we've not had. <laughs> uh, so once we do. Yes, it will be painted uh, a gray to match and to blend in uh, with the barn that's there. Um, and then we'll eventually sport, hopefully at least on, on one side of the roll-ups, my, my hope is we can sport the AAS logo and on the other side, sport a logo for Falling Star Observatory. Taking some starscape murals on the side, just to get concept. We'll see. We have to be respectful for what the park wants as far as blending in. Um, so it's one yeah. of the things we have to take into consideration is to, to sort of yeah, that's, mean the, the natural aesthetic. That's, that's our main issue there is, is that we have to uh, we have to blend in with the the historical appearance of the area, which which is why the uh, uh, the context needs to be painted the same the uh, same color as the barn basically so we're going to do a we're going to do a spray overcoat of a uh, of a light gray and then then we'll go back in with uh with hand rollers to put in uh dark gray highlights so it'll uh, more closely closely match the uh the existing barn that's the, the patina that's already yeah. <laughs> it's already accumulated yeah also Did I miss it or... oh i'm sorry go ahead Oh, I was just going to say we're planning to put a little bit of white, hopefully highly reflective white paint directly flat on the roof. We won't see it from the ground, but it'll help keep things cooler. Yep. Did I miss it or did you mention where you get a shipping container like that? Uh, we got it from a vendor in, uh, in Hutto. It's called uh, Safety Box. Uh, and that's basically their main business is that they, uh, they get these containers. Uh, this one was a this was a multi-use, gently used container, uh, so it, it made more than one trip across the Pacific, but it was not uh, it was not banged up. It had some some minor uh, cosmetic damage, is all. Um, but it is uh, watertight. Is what? It is watertight and airtight. Oh, it is water. Yes, it is watertight, um, and that's why it's, <laughs> that's why it's listed as a you know a gently used container. Um, uh, but anyway, they uh, uh, safety box did the the modifications for the roll up door and for the window uh, for the air conditioning mount. Uh, so that's that's why we basically we got delivered a a bare bones container that we didn't have to do any any metal working on. Any other questions on the construction? Yeah, do you guys uh, remodel bathrooms too? Because <laughs> you did a uh, great job, man. I've done that once. I'm not really looking to do that anymore. <laughs> as long as it doesn't involve plumbing, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, plumbing's the easy part. It's the cabinetry work that just takes time. Very time-consuming business cabinetry work. It's very precise. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for the next one, we need to do it inside of a warehouse so it can be air-conditioned the whole time and then put on site once you're done. I like that idea. Yeah, yeah. 
We just had an air conditioned workspace to work in. <laughs> no, I see possibilities for an article in Astronomy Magazine about uh, this project. I think it's darn interesting, or the reflector, or something like that. Actually, um, I have, through my work, I've been in conversation uh, with Kelly Beatty of uh, Sky and Telescope. So he's sort of aware of what we've been working on, and uh, so hopefully we can we can set up something in the, the near future. That could lead to observa requests for observatories to go. Okay, so we're going to have to work out a formula of how to do it. I say we start with 20 footers and work our way up from there. Uh, what do you figure one of those is worth delivered on site, ready to go to turn into an observatory? Turnkey observatory. No. <laughs> no. W way more than I'm willing to put my uh, my time into. <laughs> I believe, I believe Greg has an entire boat to get back to once he's got his Saturdays free again. Yeah. Oh, and Don, we appreciate your effort to, to give us the presentation tonight, too. <laughs> I think we may have to consider calling this the uh, Davies Lippincott Rody Falling Star Observatory. <laughs> no, we're not dead. No, no. no. <laughs> we're not dead yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. We've already put enough blood, sweat, and tears into that. Yeah. <laughs> so that maybe a very nice off. plaque to be put up in a corner somewhere. If you dig deep, in, deep enough, you'll find writings, plaques, Easter eggs to sci-fi nerdiness. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of epithelials. Believe me, we've left our mark in there. And plenty of sweat. Okay, well, uh, thanks again, guys. Thanks for the work and the presentation. And uh, as far as the meeting goes, uh, we've covered all of our bases unless somebody has a hot topic they want to wrap up with. No takers? Okay. Well, I do have one quick thing, just a quick mention of something that it because it fell off to the cracks on the side. Uh, the the plaque dedicating the Larry K. Forest is something that when I finally get this put to bed, I want to get back to the business of getting that and I'll present it to the EC of getting said plaque made and put on the Larry K. Forest, officially dedicating it uh, to him and naming it for him. Yeah. Uh, one question occurred to me uh, when we get the scopes out there, actually, and we're not initially going to have a pad, are we? I mean, so we, have a, we won't. Initially, the, the plan is between the observatory end doors and the fence line where they're going to put in a gate, there'll be a pathway. And then that will continue on to the henge with the intention of putting two large semicircles midway so mm -hmm. that we'll have said pad for the scopes and they'll be large enough to circle you know a ladder around both um, because the henge itself is a combination of gravel and decomposed granite, which is really not ideal for uh, for the scopes or for ladders uh, so ultimately the plan is to have those two semicircles midway pathway and then have uh, it continue on to the henge for the other telescopes as well would those be poured concrete pads uh, uh, probably not poured poured like, concrete. Uh, probably going to be more like uh, paving stones. You know, uh, close knit paving stones, because again, those are not permanent. Right? It'll be it'll be sufficient enough for ADA compliance, which should make it sufficient enough for our purposes. Yeah. The big key at the moment is to have the gate, because even without the pathway there, we can still roll telescopes across the field itself. It's relatively flat. They keep it mowed and weed whacked down pretty well. So we'll be making do, but we can definitely uh, carry on star parties and, and use the two larger scopes in that capacity. But the pad and the uh, the pathway out there will, will really help just make things a lot smoother for transitioning yeah. and setting them up. Okay. Uh, Steve, Stephen did say that 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 the uh, the gate at least should prop should be in by the end of this month. Okay. Uh, there was uh, there was still some debate going on as to whether they will do a metal gate uh, like the existing one or if they were going to do uh, a a cedar fence post uh, type gate. Uh, Is this a separate gate from the one that's out there right now? 
Yes, yes it is. It will be directly off of the end of the observatory there. Yeah. Okay. I say we just play rock, paper, scissors and put a gate in. <laughs> All right, you know, me... if we if we went out there and chopped a hole in that barbed wire and and built a gate in, um, I'd be willing to bet that uh, that, uh, uh, that Stephen just wouldn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> Again, let's be conscientious about yeah. the things we say Maybe. while streaming on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, that's true. <laughs> I forgot we're being recorded here. <laughs> so, a uh, practical reason for asking that question is we have a star party out there in July. Um, what kind of ladders do we need to use for the two scopes? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Um, the twenty-four inch. Um, don't need a very tall ladder for, as I recall. No. No. No, we don't. Twenty-five. So that's that's certainly going to be the easiest one to uh, to start off with out there. Yeah, as long um, as they're stable platforms and they have maybe four steps total, most people can get to them when they're set at a fairly high high viewing angle. You know, we, no. we just the low horizon features, no zenith stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something else of note. Um, I'm not going to use the gentleman's name, although he is watching on YouTube as we speak. I've been texting him off and on all evening. Uh, he is a former member from around the late 2000s who was here, who moved to the northeast coast up around the Hampshire area, who wants to come back and observe with us this fall and bring a large telescope with him. And so it was good to make contact with him again post COVID because none of us have spoken. He was getting geared up to do exactly that just prior. And he also wanted to see that, well, okay, is your observatory finished? Is there a place to put this? But uh, he built that while he was here. It's a 20 inch. And uh, you know, we've just been talking over the last couple of days and he's traveling at the moment. So I said, hey, let's come on, watch our, watch our presentation tonight so you can see where we are with this observatory. So, uh, um, hey, good to be talking to you again, sir. And uh, yeah, I look forward to observing with you sometime, hopefully this fall, if all goes well. One of the things we do uh, hopefully eventually want to incorporate into the observatory is at least one eight or 10 inch daub um, and a handful of binoculars so that during star parties, members can check out these objects, especially the smaller daubs. Uh, that way, you know, we always have some available for folks that don't have scopes, but do want to participate and do outreach. Um, and then they'll just get loaded back in at the end of the night. And yes, Domingo, our library will be out there as well when we build the bookshelf. Oh, that's good, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, actually, there, our plan is to have two, uh, I think we're looking at about two seven foot tall, 24 inch wide, uh, 12 inch deep bookshelves that'll flank the flat screen on the wall. Yeah, there. In the works. Yep. Uh, there will probably oh. be some some finishing touches that will go on over a period of time once the observatory is declared uh, able to house the scopes and usable on on a monthly basis. You know, little bits of this and that uh, improvements as we see what works better and what have you. Uh, by the way, we will also uh, once we have the uh, the computer built and installed out there, uh, we have uh, built into the into the walls two uh, Ethernet. Uh, circuits uh running over to the to the cape uh to the uh to the tabletop basically at the, at the far end at the, the cabinet end uh so if anybody wants to hook up uh bring in their own laptops and um you know link into the uh to the observatory's uh computer for any reason whatsoever uh we'll have that ability to do uh have the ability to do that as well and also useful that for yeah the placement of the flat screen will actually allow us to show things on the screen um, and even take the benches and set them up on the outside of the observatory just beyond that uh, that platform there so we can do talks as well. Um, as far as far as I'm concerned, at some point when it's finished, there will at least be a, what do you think, eight or 10 cup coffee maker out there? At least. Oh, at least, yes. <laughs> Very likely. All we got to do is bring your own water and supplies. Uh, and of course, planetarium software, you know, you get out there and find out the weather's not 100 percent, but you got a large group. We've got a big enough screen to show all kinds of planetarium software or presentations in that same yeah. vein. 
and we we will have outside speakers as well so that uh, if you have a group sitting outside uh watching the uh the screen through the eight foot door we'll have uh you know we'll have audio available outside for them one thing i'm thinking about is in contrast to coe where we had a combination lock so it was easy for a bunch of people to get in and out of the observatory right now we have a keyed lock and that's that limits who can get in and out and i wonder if we have any thought about possibly having a combination lock instead we could do a combination lock uh the reason we use the keyed locks that we have is they're they're circular locks so that they uh it's virtually impossible to get a bolt cutter in there to cut them off mm -hmm. Um, especially like on the, on the end doors, there's actually a, uh, um, a metal shield, a heavy, a heavy gauge metal shield around the, around the lock area itself. So that to prevent you from cutting the, the lock with a bolt cutter. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, we primarily got those locks for security purposes. Um, Keyed lock or uh, combination locks are a little easier to break, uh, but well, it just we, we could we could certainly do that. Yeah, it just means that we're going to have to have some different kind of procedures as about getting in and out and, yeah. and who can get in and out and and you know this is a detail that we'll have to work out yeah. at some point. I have a key. And it might even be yeah. so far as we have a you know a really discreet lockbox somewhere that is a combination. That has, yeah. that has the key, yeah. yeah. And also, of course, the you know the staff at headquarters have keys as well. Right, uh, right. That will be something we'll we'll need to to discuss. And um, you know, obviously, there there will be a slightly different training process to opening up this observatory than than COE was. But right. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was just going to suggest maybe having uh, like with the headquarters having a list of approved people who can have access to the key. So you can stop at the gate at the ranger station and get the key from them. Um, that's definitely a possibility. The only constraint there is that can't be the, the main source because they do have hours in which they are not open. Um, I think the headquarters closes at 430 or 530. Um, mm -hmm. So during the summer months, since it doesn't even get dark until 830 or so that that could be an issue. But we, we will we will definitely go into more discussion about what the process and procedure will be as we as we wrap things up yeah currently there are currently there are five keys uh, the the, uh, the park has one uh, then uh, Brian Dawn and I each have one and uh, uh, Joyce has one um, we can we can certainly make more copies if we need if need be but um, that was that was all we really thought we needed uh, to start yeah, off yeah. with. Yeah, it's just that I'm just thinking in terms of as as we we start being able to use it, uh, some of these things we're going to have to consider and and decide how we want to do it. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well. Haven't got anything else here. Uh, it's uh, getting close to ten o'clock. Uh, it was. Uh, I had had my doubts about how this meeting was going to come together, but it went very well. We might have a short meeting, Terry. It didn't work out that way. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's fine. That's good information. Good information. It is. It's a lot of good information. So yeah, but, it's uh, it's like any hot gas. We can fill it whatever void is available. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Brian's presentation was a highlight. And Along with Don's, of course. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I, I was wondering if anybody really wanted to hear about that anymore and decided to put one together just in case. What did you talk about? Yeah. Well, I, did. I, I had some standby stuff, but it wasn't very good, other than the, the one about uh, our representative asking the uh, Bureau of Land Management if they could move the orbit of the moon. What? <laughs> Oh my afraid. God! I'm afraid to ask who asked that. <laughs> well, I'm not going to name the politician, but uh, and the planet's rotation as well. 
Uh, yeah, the planets orbit around the sun as well. I think he was. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I think he was, he was suggesting that the uh, the Forest Service do that. Wasn't that right? Yeah, yeah the Forest Service. Or Some were suggesting that he was he was saying this kind of sarcastically because uh, he doesn't believe in in climate change and he doesn't believe there's anything we can do. But hey, if there is something we can do, maybe it could be move the orbits. So. And uh, heavenly bodies so and it depends on how you interpret what he he said i mean it was it was pretty stupid of him to say it any in in any event but uh, he doubled down on his twitter account he definitely meant what he said did he okay yes. oh okay and, so, and it is someone from texas unfortunately ah uh, well there were quite a few parents and teachers apparently who publicly made a mention and to nasa in 2017 why can't you have can the you eclipse reschedule on, the can eclipse. you reschedule can you do this it's not convenient for us yeah. Yeah. This school day yeah that was fun yeah. <laughs> well <laughs> look at it this way florida can't be the butt of every joke okay <laughs> <That's true. laughs> no but they try really hard <laughs> speaking of eclipses has anyone talked to aisd about planning for a day off for the next one it's in april right yeah well i will chime in here um with regards so uh right now there is a quarterly meeting of uh, an eclipse task force or I, I should say an eclipse committee uh, that is assembled of 17 counties in the hill country that all have their own individual eclipse task forces um, so of course travis county is included in that and we will be addressing the issue with aisd uh, that might be a little bit more problematic just to due to the size um, of the actual district um, I do know that, for instance, Bandera County out in uh, further west, they're pretty much not planning to, to have school run because they're a small county with only two roads in and out. Um, and folks will be getting ready to hop on the bus to go home from school right around the time everybody's hopping in the cars to leave. Um, oh, God. Yeah, I heard stories about the eclipse in the northwest that it took people hours to, to get back to their hotels. So just that might be a concern, too. Oh, we don't know. Yeah. Anybody. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I had, what was that I like? Had, I had a friend that that made it out to Oregon Star Party 2017. It took him it took him 14 and a half hours to get from Portland to Prineville, yeah. which is normally about a three and a half hour drive. Yeah. Brian and I were were with Terry and Darcy and Casper, and uh, even though we left after the finish of the latter half of the partial, we went to lunch um, and it still took us, what, nine hours to get from Casper to Cheyenne, which is a two hour drive. Oh, I hunkered down. I stayed another night. Yeah, you were smart. smart. I think I was um, but, but on that same note, I wanted to let folks know, uh, for those of you that are in Travis County, uh, the Travis County Friends of the Night Sky is reconvening, um, and that meeting is going to be next week on Thursday. Um, so if any of you are interested in participating in that, please drop me a line. Um, if you happen to be in, is there anybody here that is not in Travis County? And Tim and Cass don't even bother raising your hands. We know where you are. <laughs> Actually, where are you I'm in Williamson now. Yeah, we don't cover Williamson. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Williamson too. Where are you, Henry? Well, uh, Williamson as well. Williamson. I will say um, that recently a group has formed, I think they call themselves the Liberty Hill Save Our Stars. Uh, so they are also a, a group of volunteers that has formed in Williamson County to to combat light pollution. I was going to say, I could, I could walk across the street and be in Travis. <laughs> is that close, it's, huh? Yeah, it, it literally is that close. And, Me too. And Are you in Lincoln area? No, uh, near Pond Springs Road. Okay. I'm on Lake Line Mall. Okay. okay. Yeah. And Brian, there is actually a Hayes County Friends of the Night Sky as well. Glad to hear that. We need to protect what we got. This is Tony. Uh, Jess and I just bought a house out in Taylor, just south of Taylor High School on 973. Congratulations. You have a new puppy, nice. right? Yes, we do have a new puppy. <laughs> What's that, Bastrop County, Tony? Uh, no, it's in Wilco. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, we were in Pflugerville before. It's a little darker out here. We can actually see a lot more in our backyard now. Oh, I think we're the only ones with a view of the Canadian Rockies at our 
window here. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you got us all definitely beaten on yeah, that. But it, but it doesn't get dark until 11 o'clock. Oh, so no. Yeah. It kind of limits yeah. the view. Yeah, I remember that. December. Yeah, wait till December. December. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might not get dark at all. <laughs> there was one year we were traveling from London to Glasgow by train. And oh. Joyce was commenting on how dark the clouds were. And I said, it always gets dark at night. And she said, Jim, it's 2.30. And I said, red glow on the horizon, that's sunset. This was December. December yeah. 22nd, yeah. winter solstice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell, they're telling us that it'll be dark by three in the afternoon here. By wow. Now. Yeah, 2.30 two, yeah. two yeah. was sunset. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jess and I lived in Minneapolis for four years, and in the middle of winter, it was the pitch black by 445. Oh, yeah. We're at 48.8 degrees. We're, uh, as we're about 17 miles from the Canadian border, so we're way up there. Yeah. Milky Way, I mean the Milky Way, the Big Dipper was hard to find. It's right overhead. It's straight overhead. <laughs> oh, I don't know if my equatorial mount will go to 48 degrees. It's going up to 90, then it becomes an out to end. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's quite, that's, yeah, a lot of difference there, which, uh, like I said, that's the reason I got my Lunt. Um, I got it from a guy in Fairbanks, Alaska, who told me outright, okay, I've played with this for five months. Now I'm going to sell it because I can't use it for the next six months. Yeah. Well, good night, everybody. Enjoyed. <laughs> we enjoyed the meeting. Yeah, I enjoyed the remote. And seeing great, everybody. Yeah, great yeah. to see everybody. Yeah. Here. Take the stream. Take Is the stream still running? Stay out of the hospital. <laughs> it's still running. Stream. All right, guys. Guess we'll wrap it up. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Jerry, how do we contact you to, for? Uh, Putting down interest on those items from the estate sale. Uh, ask me the question again. How do we contact you about items oh, we're interested in on the estate yeah, sale? Get in the chat here and put my email address on. Uh, let's see. Two. They sent you a couple of chat messages, Terry. Did you see them? Uh, yeah, I read some of them, but not all of them. Maybe. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, now, don't you go giving away my binoculars, Terry? Even if it was <laughs> on earlier. Okay, that's the email address you can get me on T E R J T A O S E T I dot com. How city? What uh, what part of Austin are they located in? North, south, east, west, or uh, the, the equipment? Yeah, no, it's in my garage. Okay, so far north, north Austin. North. <laughs> far north. Okay, <laughs> might just be easier to buy it off of eBay. <laughs> yeah. So if you're in the area and you want to help me play with these mounts, uh, check them out. Uh, sure, drop by. <laughs> Let me know, Terry. Okay. Brian, where are you located? Oh, um, I'm located in South Austin, okay. down in Manchac and South of Slaughter. So opposite end of the world, basically. <laughs> Close to me. The cool part of town. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah. Almost as far south as I am. Oh, the cool part of town is North Austin, where all the good Asian food is. Oh, I, yeah, that's that's yeah. hurtful. That's hurtful. I'm half Korean. This is hurtful. Mm -hmm. It's true. Okay. Nice. All right, Terry. I'll contact you. Thank. You. Thanks a lot. Okay. I gotta run get cat food. Good night, y'all. Good meeting. Thanks. Right. Bravo. Good night, Jane. Bravo. Night. Good night. Good night, all. It's a very dramatic voice talking about the recording. <laughs>